Yes, you are. All right. Yes, uh, maybe before we start, um, we can start with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us together this evening, um, trusting that everybody is still about to listen to your word with regards to a very interesting matter. Be with the speaker, the words he will utter, dear Lord. You May you guide him through his words that he utters. In your name we pray, amen. All right, um, so our speaker for this evening is Brother Chris Shinonge. Um, the topic for this evening is culture and indoctrination and maybe just a few rules of the house before we continue maybe we all keep our mics muted um yeah over to brother chris happy sabbath everyone um it's yeah it's glad to see you all here uh right on time i know my my lighting's not great but um, most of the time you won't be looking at my face because i will be sharing my screen anyway um, i hope i'm audible i'm using my earphones because i believe that um, the sound is better with my earphones. So I'll take it that I'm, I'm audible and I'll proceed to share my screen. Let me share my screen. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, so I think the, the host has to make me a co-host in order for me to, to share my screen. Gosh. Yeah, so I need to be made a co-host in order to share my, my screen. Okay, I see Let's it's check. been amended. Okay, great. Um, here it is. Okay, I hope you can all see. Um, I'm going to do a presentation view because uh, it's often clearer to see in presentation view. There we go. Can you can you see that? If you can see that, great. So. Um, you won't be able to see everything that, that is scattered across the screen uh, because I know there's a, a, a small window that appears with, with at least my face um, on it, but I will be very audible, so you'll be able to follow what I'm reading. Shall we pray before I begin? Let's pray. Father in heaven, as I'm about to um, share what you have shared with me, I pray that your Holy Spirit may, may speak through me, Heavenly Father, and that you may reach every individual wherever they are in their spiritual journey and um, help them derive something spiritual for their own lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So Amen. Um, this evening um, we are starting part one of two of our um, series on culture and indoctrination. And this evening's um, presentation or discussion will take more more of uh, the form of a a reading um, we're going to read a lot and i would encourage you to read particularly two chapters from the book desire of ages the one the first one is called the chosen people and the second one is called the imprisonment and death of john so our, our devotion or our thoughts for reflection will mainly come from those two uh, chapters in the desire of ages and we will read a lot of it together uh, this this evening so a very interesting and fascinating topic, culture and indoctrination. And the title of our message this evening, as you can see in front of you, is for they do not know what they are doing. They do not know what they are doing. Okay. But I, I trust that you can see the heading of, of the first slide. And the question that I ask there is, are you the only ones with the truth? You know, we live in a, a postmodern era where it, it is believed uh, by many, that there is no such thing as an absolute truth. There is no one who can claim to hold the truth and to hold it exclusively, so to speak. There's no one who can claim to uh, be the depositaries or the custodians of truth because truth is relative, truth is particular, truth is circumstantial. So you cannot claim to be the only ones with the truth. You cannot claim that only one religion is the right religion. You cannot claim that only one Messiah is the right Messiah. You cannot claim that only one uh, denomination has the truth uh, or is the vessel of the truth. And it's an important question to ask, are you or is it possible for, for, for one person or one group of people to be the only ones with the truth? Jesus said to the woman at the well, he said to her, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews, 
And Jesus said this to her at a time when she, she was busy having a theological discussion back and forth with him, saying that our, our fathers worship in this mountain and, you know, um, we are expecting a Messiah to come. And Jesus punctuated her, her, her theological discourse and said, you do not know what you're worshiping. He says, us Jews know what we are worshiping because salvation is of the Jews. In this day and age, such a statement would be considered uh, pompous, proud, uh, displaying superiority, uh, and, and, and obviously uh, philosophically untenable because no one is the, the custodian of the truth. But Jesus said the Jewish people as a nation uh, are the ones who are the custodians of the truth. In the book of Romans, uh, Paul begins an argument in Romans chapter 1, uh, concluding how the, um, uh, displaying how the Gentiles are, are condemned or judged by God because of the path they have chosen in life. Then in Romans chapter 2, he goes on to, to describe how the Jews themselves are condemned because of the path they have chosen in life. And, and he concludes Romans chapter 2 in saying that then, then, you know, it doesn't matter whether you are a Jew or you're a Gentile. You are both condemned because of uh, breaking the law. The Gentiles break the law outside of the law. The Jews break the law, but they do it you know, knowing the law. And then he asks the question in the next chapter, Romans chapter 3, verse 1, what advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? And he responds by saying, much in every way. I like it in the King James. It says, much every way chiefly. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. The King James would say, unto them belong the oracles of God. So he says, the Jews are the custodians of the truth. The Jews are the ones who have um, the vast resources that God has given them to share to the world. He says, that's the only advantage that they have, in that they are the de depositaries of God's law. They are the custodians of the truth. So the idea that there is a certain group of people or certain individuals who know and have the truth for certain and for sure, is not foreign to the Bible. It is a biblical principle. And, and Jesus, the greatest teacher that ever lived, Paul, the second greatest teacher that ever lived, both affirm that the Jews, a certain group of people that God had elected, that he had separated, that he had drawn out from the quarry and the quagmire of heathenism and, and, and paganism and idolatry, they are the ones were the custodians of the truth. But the, the Jews had problems, okay? In spite of being given the truth, in spite of being given all the privileges and benefits of being the chosen vessels of God, they had a number of problems. And the first one is that they pursued what they thought as God's agenda using selfish and loveless motives. Selfish and loveless motives motives in the dark ages and this should be page 29 we are told that by the time of the babylonish captivity right after they went into exile in babylon by the babylonish captivity the israelites were effectually cured of the worship of graven images during the centuries that followed they suffered from the oppression of heathen foes until the conviction became fixed that their prosperity depended upon their obedience to the law of God. But with too many of the people, obedience was not prompted by love. The motive was selfish. They rendered outward service to God as the means of attaining national greatness. So the first problem that we see with the Jews is that they had twisted or distorted notions. They could only come uh, to experience the blessings of God if they were obedient to God. And they then pursued obedience. So that in the covenant. So the problem with the Jews is that they, they pursued God um, using selfish and loveless motives. The second one, which leads on from that, is that the Jews then developed these very strong nationalistic tendencies. We are told that they looked upon Jerusalem as their heaven. And they were actually jealous. <laughs> they were actually jealous 
lest the Lord should show mercy to the Gentiles. So they were absorbed with the idea that they were a chosen people, that they were separated, that um, they were greater and better than all the pagan nations around them. And they didn't want these nations to share in the blessings of the covenant. This was a problem. Another problem with the Jews is that they borrowed heathen ideas and customs. I'm going to read some long, long passages um, to that effect. We're told that after the return from Babylon, much attention was given to religious instruction. All over the country, synagogues were erected where the law was expounded by priests and scribes, and schools were established, which together with the arts and sciences professed to teach the principles of righteousness. But these agencies became corrupted. During the captivity, many of the people had received heathen ideas and customs, and these were brought into their religious service. In many things, they conformed to the practices of idolaters. So the Jews, after coming out of exile from Babylon, you know, it was a 70-year exile. Some of them died there, some of them remained. But after coming back, they went into an aggressive and a deliberate uh, project to develop themselves as a nation. And they established institutions in order to develop and grow and be entrenched in the things of God. But then they they carried into these institutions, they carried into their learning, into their teaching, into their customs, uh, the, the practices and ideas that they had observed in Babylon. And eventually their religion then became corrupted because they, they, they thought and they esteemed the ideas and the things that they saw in Babylon. I mean, Babylon was, was magnificent. You can think of the, the, the awe and the overwhelming nature of uh, the architecture and, and the great statues. You just think of the Ishtar gate that Daniel probably walked through. There were 120 lions, 60 on each side. Um, the bricks were, were, were blue and there were dragons there um, uh, that were, were meant for the worship of their gods. And it was just, you know, benumbing to the senses. And not only that, these people were, were, were scientific and they were advanced in, in science. And the Jews esteemed all these things and they... They, 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 they were influenced by some of the thoughts, the ideologies that permeated uh, Babylonian culture, and they brought this into the Jewish service. Another problem is that because they were nationalistic, because they had selfish motives, they ended up pursuing the wrong agenda. So when Christ came, they were pursuing the wrong ag agenda. We are told in Desire of Ages that they did not seek redemption from sin, but deliverance from the Romans. They looked for the Messiah to come as a conqueror, to break the oppressor's power, and exalt Israel to universal dominion. Thus, the way was prepared for them to reject the Savior. At the time of the birth of Christ, the nation was chafing under the rule of a foreign masters. Sounds a little bit like they were colonized and wrecked with internal strife. The Jews had been permitted to maintain the form of a separate government, but nothing, nothing could disguise the fact that they were under Roman yoke or reconcile them to the restriction of their power. The Romans claimed the right of appointing and removing the high priest. Can you believe that? And the office was often secured by fraud, bribery, and even murder. And we complain about TOC sessions. This is hectic. Okay, fraud and bribery, maybe. But murder. Thus, the priesthood became more and more corrupt. Yet the priests still possessed great power and they employed it for selfish and mercenary ends. So their whole system was messed up. Their whole system was corrupt from the head to the toe. The priests were corrupt. The priests just wanted to pursue a nationalistic agenda. And these people were people who were steeped in the Torah, who memorized portions of the Torah. And yet, were corrupt to the core. 
they pursued the wrong agenda with every fiber of their being. In Acts 5, verse 37, Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, records that a certain Judas, a, Galilee, a, Galilee, a Galilean, right? A certain Judas, a Galilean, caused an, upri caused an uprising. Sorry, it's about caused an uprising early in the first century with his philosophy that the people of God should recognize only God as their ruler and Lord and refuse to pay taxes to a pagan overlord. And he records this in Antiquities, right? The, the New Testament reports that the rebellion came to a miserable end. You can read that in Acts chapter 5, verse 37. So they, they had this nationalistic thing. And they had so many revolutionaries rising, one after another, claiming to free them from, from, from oppression, claim, claim, claiming to, to be a messiah uh, of, of sorts. And even when Jesus arose, some mistook him for just another revolutionary who was coming to free them from uh, Roman oppression. Among the Dead Sea Scrolls discovered in caves near Qumran was found a so-called war scroll, right? Written at the beginning of the Christian era. It described a battle plan for these Qumran uh, covenanters to fight the last holy war against Rome. You know? They called it Kitim and Belial. The expectation again was that God would intervene with his holy angels and give the faithful remnant of Israel eternal victory through a display of Michael's power as a divine warrior. This political hope for a brighter future reached such feverish pitch in the first century AD that it led to the Jewish uprising against Rome in AD 66 to 70 and again in AD 32. Okay, I'll just ask that you please mute yourself if you just joined. On both occasions, the Jews began a military war against the Roman Empire, trusting that God would vindicate them with a supernatural victory. Now we know in AD 70 that Jerusalem was utterly destroyed and that Jesus predicted this destruction. And those who obeyed the voice of Jesus, who, who, who obeyed the prophecy, who, who clung to his words, were saved from the destruction that fell upon Jerusalem in AD 70. But this just goes to demonstrate or to show um, the extent of this nationalistic agenda that the Jews had and this apocalyptic fever that infected them because they anticipated uh, deliverance, because they interpreted the prophecies in a certain way. They this was the, 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 the agenda that, that really, really obsessed them and became the prison through which they viewed every prophecy that they were given in the Old Testament. And you know, you think that it's just this corrupt, the corrupt priests who were influenced by this nationalistic ideology. But it, it, was not just, it was not just them. Everyone was influenced by this nationalistic um, agenda and, 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 and this apocalyptic fever of national deliverance from Roman oppression. Even John the Baptist, one who had you know, given his life for the cause, one who had separated himself or who was separated from the influence of the rabbinical school so that he wasn't contaminated uh, by their influence. Even he did not fully escape the ideology of his day. In Luke chapter 7, verse 19, we find him asking a question in the dungeon uh, through his, his, his followers. And John calling unto him two of his disciples sent them to Jesus saying, Art thou he that should come? Or look we for another? Man, this was a very painful time in John's life as we're about to read. And instead of shouting out his doubts and proclaiming his doubts, he sent a private inquiry to the Savior. You know, he sent a private communication through two of his disciples to the Savior to ask, man, are we mis was I mistaken here? You know, I studied the pro prophecies. I memorized these things. You know, I've devoted my youth to them. I'm prepared to die for this. But it looks like, man, what's happening here is not what I anticipated. We are told in the Desire of Ages that like the Savior's disciples, John the Baptist did not understand the nature of Christ's kingdom. He expected Jesus to take the throne of David 
And as time passed, and the Savior made no claim to kingly authority, John became, became perplexed and troubled. And I picture in my mind John sitting in a cold, dark dungeon, probably wet, probably smelly, probably full of the sounds of, of, of rats and, and, and mice and, and you know, the echoes um, of someone being tortured somewhere in another part of the dungeon. And he is dejected. Why was he dejected? He expected Jesus to take the throne of David. And he didn't. John's, John's faith was shaken. Um, to a great extent, his faith, his faith was shaken. He had not counted his life, we are told, dear unto himself, that he might fulfill his appointed work. And now from his dungeon, he watched for the lion of the tribe of Judah to cast down the pride of the oppressor and to deliver the poor and him that cried. But Jesus seemed to content himself with gathering disciples about him and healing and teaching the people. He was eating at the tables of the publicans, while every day the Roman yoke rested more heavily upon Israel, while King Herod and his vile paramour worked their will, and the cries of the poor and suffering went up to heaven. Imagine the thoughts that tortured uh, John. To the desert prophet, all this seemed a mystery beyond his fathoming. There were hours when, when the whisperings of demons tortured his spirit and the shadow of a terrible fear crept over him. Could it be, could it be that the long hoped for deliverer had not yet appeared? Then what meant the message that he himself had been impelled to bear? John had been bitterly disappointed in the result of his mission. Bitterly disappointed. John saw his life as a failure. His preaching, his sacrifice, his social isolation, um, all of it to him was nothingness. And, and, and it was not just internal thoughts that troubled him. It was the whispering of demons. Satan was on his case to crush him out uh, through his disappointment because of the way he understood uh, the mission of the Messiah. And this was influenced by the culture, the ideas, the doctrines that were current and trending in Israel. We are told in Acts chapter 13, verse 27, that the people in Jerusalem and their leaders did not recognize Jesus as one of the prophets, had as, one, as the one the prophets had spoken about. This is from the New Living Translation. Instead, they condemned him. And in doing this, they fulfilled the prophet's words that are read every Sabbath. So these people read the prophecies every Sabbath. They were indoctrinated, so to speak. And yet, in spite of being indoctrinated or being taught, being schooled every single Sabbath, they did not recognize the one they were being schooled about. In Matthew 5, verse 48, Christ says that ye search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. But these are they which testify of me. They had failed to see him in the scriptures that they read. They were blinded by nationalistic pride. Jesus said, as he hung upon the cross and was about to expire, being killed by people he came to save, being rejected by the nation that he had chosen, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Wow. They did not know what they were, they were doing after centuries and centuries of prophetic voices, after witnesses of miracles and uh, divine intervention in their history, after the demonstration of miracles and power after the time prophecies in the books of Daniel and Jeremiah. After all those things, Jesus said, they do not know what they are doing. 
and he asks for their forgiveness. Had they known, we are told in DA 7744, had they known that they were putting to torture one who had come to save the sinful race from eternal ruin, they would have been seized with remorse and horror. But their ignorance did not remove their guilt. For it was their privilege to know and accept Jesus as their Savior. So Jesus says, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. That ignorance doesn't remove their guilt. They are still guilty. They are still guilty. They are guilty because they had the privilege. They are guilty because they had the opportunity. They are guilty because they had the time. They are guilty because it was their privilege to know and accept Jesus as their savior, but they did not use that privilege. You know, Ellen White, in explaining Christ's prayer, forgive them for they know not what they're doing, said that this prayer extends to all of humanity and that once further light was given to them and they were given an opportunity to embrace the truth and they rejected the prayer was ineffectual for them. So God God calls for us to lead where he follows, to embrace the light that he gives, to use every opportunity and advantage to know the truth that has been revealed before we go running around pursuing all these other things and all these other ideologies and philosophies. Be established in the truth that you have been given because God will not give you new light that stands in stark contrast and contradicts completely light that he has he has revealed in the past. It doesn't work like that. Now, as we begin to, to wind up this brief uh, presentation this evening, we're going to look at, at John the Baptist's ingredients for victory because John, John the Baptist did not die a depressed man. He died a victorious man. He died a man who was confident of his mission, who knew that his short 30-something-year-old life you know, would make an impact that would send you know, shock waves through history. He knew that he had lived for a purpose and that he had accomplished his mission and he slept and, 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 and rested, um, even though he died a violent death in the end. Now I'm quoting from Reserve Ages, but I've structured it and broken it down so that we can follow a logical se- sequence. But the Baptist did not surrender his faith in Christ. This is following on from the passage that I read that showed his perplexity, you know, how he felt that he, he felt at some point that his life and, and his, his, his mission was a failure. We are told that, but the Baptist did not surrender his faith in Christ, in spite of the perplexity, in spite of the fact that he didn't understand what Christ was all about. He didn't surrender his faith, okay? And there are about five things. I've broken it down into about five parts. Voice from heaven and the descending dove. These are the things that spoke to him. The memory of the voice from heaven and the descending dove. This is at the baptism. The spotless, spotless purity of Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit that rested upon him as a spiritual experience that he had um, with Christ. Number four, crucially, the test was to him. It was clear that the time is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. This mixture, these ingredients, all of them witnessed that Jesus of Nazareth was the promised one. Confirm that Jesus of Nazareth was the promised one. He did not reject the testimony of the prophetic script of heaven. He did not rely on the memory of the voice of, from heaven um, and exclude the test. Combined spiritual victory in a time of doubt, perplexity in a time uh, when many would eventually reject Christ, where many would be guilty of crucifying him. Uh, John was victorious. What about us, our ingredients? Well, of course, our, agree, our ingredients would be very similar to John's ingredients. In messages to young people, the prophet of the Lord says that there are three ways in which the Lord reveals his will to us to guide us. Okay? Three ways in which the Lord reveals his, his will to us to guide us. Number one, God reveals his will to us in his word. The Holy Scriptures, right? God reveals his will to us in his word, the Holy Scriptures. This is the first and primary way in which God, we've got the Bible. His will is written in the Bible. Number two, workings, right? And finally, well, number three, another way in which God's voice is heard is through the appeals on the heart, which will be wrought out in the character, okay? So those are the three ways in which we can know God's will. Indoctrination that leads us to accept things uncritically, an indoctrination that leads us to miss what is important for our spiritual existence. One, through the Holy Scriptures. We need to be immersed in the Holy Scriptures. We need to be uh, grounded in the truth. We need to understand for ourselves what the Bible says um, about 
who God is, God's purposes for humanity and our personal destiny. Number two, his voice is revealed in providential workings, the things that happen in our lives, you know, uh, the way he orchestrates the affairs of our lives, the people he brings into our lives, uh, the messages that he sends to us at certain times in our experiences. These are the providential workings of God. And he also speaks to us through the impressions of the Holy Spirit. We cannot take that away. He impresses the truth upon us, that still small voice that tells us that, no, this is what I want you to learn now. This is the truth now. And this is not just arbitrary voices that make you, you know, drive around your car, uh, bobbing your head to nice spiritual songs. No, these are impressions that are wrought out in character development. We see ourselves um, loving the things that we once hated, hating the things that we once loved and that took us away from God. These are, uh, are things that are wrought upon our character. The impressions of the Spirit um, help us draw closer to God, help us to become more spiritual, help us to become more patient spouses, help us to become more patient parents, help us to become more loving siblings, help us uh, to become uh, more respectful children. The impressions of the Spirit are wrought out in our character. Okay? And these will be the ingredients for us as young people to escape the indoctrination, to escape the, the, the pitfalls that befell the Jews, even though they were the depositaries of the truth. And it is my prayer this evening that as we journey on in this spiritual walk, we may learn to discern God's voice and that we may allow God to guide us in the way of truth. Amen? Because God only has good intentions for us. But if we allow ourselves to become absorbed in our own agendas, if we allow ourselves to import the agendas from heathenism like the Jews did, if we are, uh, allow ourselves to interpret the scriptures from a position of pride like the Jews did, we will find ourselves committing ghastly spiritual crimes like the Jews ended up doing. May God bless us. May God bless you and your families as you meditate on his word and you consider what God's plans are for you as an individual and um, for his people as a church. Amen. Amen. And with that, um, I think I will, I will just close with a, a word of prayer before I hand over. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for giving us this opportunity to reflect on the thoughts that you have inspired, to look into the past, to learn from the past, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll give us time to go through um, the two chapters in the Desire of Ages on the imprisonment and death of John and the chosen nation, that we may extract um, lessons uh, for us individually and as a church as well, as a, as a movement, as a, as a fellowship. I, I pray that you also help us um, to stand firm on Bible truth, to understand it for ourselves, first of all, and um, experience the character change and the peace that you've promised. Pray for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for those wonderful words. Um, maybe before we continue and hand over to Newa for a vote of thanks, i uh, just like to announce that this Sabbath evening, we are having a part two, um, Sabbath afternoon rather, tomorrow at two o'clock in the afternoon. If there is anybody with comments or questions, or questions rather, they can hand them over to Neo. Maybe Neo will let them know how to pass them over and then you can pass them over to the speaker for preparation for Sabbath afternoon's discussion. Thank you, Neo. Great. Um, yes, thanks. Thanks for the number. Um, yes, tomorrow, I employ everyone to join us again tomorrow. Um, our session will start at two o'clock um, in the afternoon. Um, so whatever questions that we have for tonight, can we just pop them and we'll pass them over to the preacher tomorrow. We can either do it via um, you guys personally inboxing me um, or asking them as the session um, goes up. Um, so once again, we'd like to thank Brother Chris for sharing with us today and we ask that he well god keeps him until we continue our session again tomorrow um thanks everyone for joining and yeah
see the tomorrow. Um, I think that's it from my side. We can, yeah, we'll see each other tomorrow. <laughs> bye, 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 everyone. Thanks, thanks for coming through. Um, see you tomorrow. Tomorrow promises to be very practical and interesting.